Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 17, uh, reading verses 1 through 9. This it begins on page 1156 in the Pew Bibles, if you would like to follow along there. We read now these words of Matthew. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and the brothers James and John and led them up a high mountain where they were alone. As they looked on, a change came over Jesus. His face was shining like the sun and his clothes were dazzling white. Then the three disciples saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. So Peter spoke up and said to Jesus, Lord, how good it is that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was talking, a shining cloud came over them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my own dear son, with whom I am pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard the voice, they were so terrified that they threw themselves face downward on the ground. Jesus came to them and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. So they looked up and saw no one there but Jesus. As they came down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Don't tell anyone about this vision you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from death. May God bless the reading of this word. Incomplete. Now there's a word we don't often like to hear. Perhaps you heard that if you were in a college class or even in, in school and you turned something in and got it back and the, and the teacher, the professor wrote on it or said to you, this, it's okay, but it's incomplete. We uh, know about it. I mean, it, it's as bad as it is to hear it pertaining to um, college class or something else, maybe a project at work or whatever. We hear it sometimes when we're listening to a football game. Oh, the quarterback has thrown a pass and it's incomplete. Just when we knew that to, to advance down the field, they had to complete that pass. But something has happened and the quarterback did not connect with the receiver. Incomplete. It means that something has not been finished as it should be. We don't like incomplete. Loose ends need to be tidied up, need to be brought together. But you know what? Sometimes even scripture leaves us with loose ends. And somehow the transfiguration does that. I know, I know, we read it and we're always talking and, and even the commentators talk about how this is the, the revelation of God, that this is his son and, and we see the divinity of Christ in this. This is what we so often do, especially when we look at these verses as standalone like we have done today. We don't usually see the loose ends because we focus on the divinity. We see his face shining and we think of the divine versus the human. That now the divine is being revealed in a, in a very special way. Yet is this the revelation of the divine that causes God to speak? Maybe it is. But we also cannot look at these verses Consider these verses without understanding some of the rest of Scripture. Without understanding some of the rest of Matthew itself. Jesus took the disciples, and we'll start with that. Jesus took three of the disciples and went up on the mountain. Now, this represents, and I always did in, in, in ancient times, this was representing that that place where heaven and earth met. So Jesus goes up on the mountain 
And he is in that place where there is this transition between heaven and earth. And it is a very special place. It is a place where humanity meets the divine. With that in mind, you have to think in terms of the two people that were suddenly there, Moses and Elijah. Moses, we know the stories, if we've read any of the Old Testament, the stories of Moses encounters with God beginning at the burning bush, but then as he led the people in the wilderness, he went up on Mount Sinai and there he met God. And there he spoke to God. And once a, one of those times in particular, scripture tells us when he came off of the mountain, his face radiated the glory that he had experienced to the point that the people said, Moses, we can't look upon you veil your face and so he did we can't look at you so you've got that elijah elijah this prophet of of immense magnitude he proclaims that it won't rain and for seven years it doesn't rain he goes into the mountain and he meets god there the mountain a place where the divine and the human can encounter each other. Very special place. Moses then Elijah. They radiated the power of God when they came off of the mountain. Others saw and knew. Okay. A little bit of, of Old Testament background. But I will tell you, when as, as you read this, and you don't catch it if you see this as stand alone. But I am here to tell you I feel sorry for Peter. Not because of what takes place on this mountain, but because Peter at this point in time is so desperately trying to wrap his head around everything that Jesus has been saying and everything that is happening. And my goodness, when you think about it, how hard it is for him to wrap his head around all of this, it's amazing sometimes that we can catch any of it. Because, you know, Peter's right there. Firsthand, he is getting the teaching of Jesus. He's getting the opportunity to ask the, the questions. Some of them, I'm sure the questions that we would go, oh my, that's a no-brainer. That's a dumb question. No, no question is dumb if you need the answer. And Peter needed a lot of answers. He's having trouble understanding this. And he shows it. He shows it here, but so often we don't catch it. Okay. Peter, why do I say this? Well, because following a discussion, and this is just pre prior to this in, in, uh, in, in Matthew, following a discussion of who people say Jesus is, Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter blurts out. He says, you are the Messiah. And Jesus says to him, Good answer. God has shown you that. God has revealed that to you and you have answered what God has revealed to you. Good answer. And can you imagine, Peter? I mean, think about any of us. We, we, we do something like that and we're like, wow, I got it right. You know, this is good. You don't go much farther in Matthew until Jesus now says, he said, again, remember, Peter has said, you are the Messiah. Very next thing Matthew tells us is Jesus is traveling with the disciples and he says to them, you need to understand, I, he doesn't say the Messiah, he says, I, and Peter's already said, you are the Messiah. I must go to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, I will be, I will suffer. I will be put on trial by the religious leaders, and I will be killed. 
and the third day I will rise again. This is too much for Peter. And he, and it says, he took Jesus aside and he rebuked him. And when it's saying he rebuked him, he's saying he is arguing with him about that statement. No, no, never. Never will this happen. You shall not do that. This cannot happen to you. And Jesus turns around and looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You are th not thinking in terms of God's wisdom, but in terms of humanity's wisdom. Peter, who has just received accolades from Jesus, is now being condemned by Jesus. Wow, how, how about that? We go from being commended to condemned almost in heartbeat as we read it in Scripture. Very little time has passed, obviously. He's having trouble <coughs> understanding all of this. So when we have the transfiguration, all of a sudden you've got Peter now. He's, he's up there with Jesus. So Jesus apparently sees something in Peter, but Peter is still, he's struggling with all of this. He is struggling with what the Messiah means. And now on the mountain, he sees the face of Jesus radiant and he sees his clothing shining and he sees Jesus standing there with Moses and Elijah and he wants to build, whether it says shelters, booths, tents, he wants to build something to preserve the moment. But if there's something more than just preserving the moment, something more than honoring Moses and Elijah and Jesus. Now, some talk about Moses in, in the transfiguration, Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. And there is truth to all of that. But there's something else that's interesting about these two. I told you they went on the mountain and they met God. Moses, it says in Deuteronomy, toward the end of Deuteronomy, it talks about the death of Moses. And what it talks about is that Moses went out and he looked at, uh, on, a, on a hillside, on a mountainside with God and looked out across the land of uh, the river Jordan and, uh, and into Canaan because he didn't get to go. Because it, it says he and Aaron, his brother, had not honored the name of God in one particular instance. And no one else is with them. And it says that God took Moses and he buried him. Moses died and he was buried. And Deuteronomy says, and to this day, no one knows where the grave is. Yet here is Moses standing before Jesus and the disciples. Elijah. Elijah. It, it describes his death in, in a dramatic way. It says that, that he has taken on a pupil by the name of Elisha, and he's told Elisha, stay here in this particular location. And Elisha says, I'm not going to do it. I'm going with you. All right, come on. And that happens two or three times until they cross the Jordan River. And Elisha says, what can... I give to you, what, can, what would you ask? And, and Elisha says, because he has already figured out that Elijah's about to die, about to be taken from him. He says, can I have, if, if God will hear my request, it is that I receive a double portion of your spirit. That would mean in this instance that Elijah's mantle would be there. Well, this time, when Elijah says, stay put, Elisha does. And Elijah goes on off by himself a little ways, and they're separated, and, and, and he, can't, he can't go to his master. Elisha can no longer go to his master. 
And that the fiery chariot of God comes and comes and, and picks Elijah up and takes him off. There is in this, in this instance, these two stories, something about an abnormal death. They don't, we don't, they don't die the way death takes place. And Peter, I believe Peter in his mind is saying, I want you, Jesus, to be like Moses and Elijah. You're the Messiah. You can't die. You can't do this. This cannot happen. And it is in that, and therefore he wants to build the, the, the shrines. He wants, to, he wants this so that it will not take place. These two endings to their life, Moses and Elijah, stand in sharp contrast to what Jesus has proclaimed about himself. He has told the disciples he must go to Jerusalem, he must suffer, and he must be killed. Wow. Having stated that Jesus was Messiah, and he got that right, Peter got that right, now Peter is still having trouble with the idea of a suffering Messiah. What better way to change the outcome than to build the booths, to build the tents, to build the shrines? Peter's way of saying, you are to be like Moses and Elijah. They didn't die and neither should you. You see, we build shrines to preserve something. But it's incomplete. No sooner did Peter suggest that than there was a cloud and a voice. One way or the other, we're going to bring Peter to a different reality. And if we will listen, perhaps each of us to a different <clears throat> reality. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Peter has an incomplete understanding of Messiah. He wants Jesus to rule from the mountain. He wants Jesus to be untouched by death and always closer to heaven. This, in his thinking, is the way of the true Messiah. Even today, there are many people who don't get what Jesus was saying about Messiah. They become much like those who belittled and mocked the early church. Uh, those that, that uh, as Peter was writing his second letter to the church, and he is talking about those false teachers, those who, who mock, those who, who deny, those who, who call all of this myth, which is to say that it, it, myth is something that lacks truth or historical proof. And, and in 2 Peter, as he talks about the transfiguration, Peter says, this which we have seen, this which is spoken of by the prophets, and so as you read, the, he's saying, as you read the prophets, it should give you a different understanding now of what it means. This was, the, the prophecies were confirmed and I and the other disciples were eyewitnesses to this. Even today, there are those that have an incomplete picture of Messiah. A Messiah that we want to stay on the mountain. A Messiah that makes all things wonderful and pretty and good. Well, I told you, we get a misunderstanding and an incomplete picture if we don't look at the things around it. Jesus, now after this, when he got them up because, you know, they reacted the way any sane person does in the presence of the holy and they fell.
fell on their faces terrified. When Jesus got them up, he brought them back down the mountain. He's going to give them a more complete picture of Messiah. They came off of the mountain, and you know what they were immediately met by? A very messy exorcism. To be on the mountain is a wonderful experience. Who doesn't like to be in the presence of God on the mountain? Who doesn't want those experiences? Wonderful experience. The thing is, is that if that was what was to take place, Jesus would have stayed there and asked us all to come up on the mountain and join him. Instead, he brought the disciples back down the mountain and they got mixed up. They got mixed up in something that was very, very messy. Man comes to Jesus and says, I brought my son to, the, to your disciples and uh, they couldn't cure him. Sometimes he throws himself in the fire and other times he throws himself in the water and, and uh, they couldn't help him. It says Jesus cast out the demon. And later the disciples said, uh, what's, what's going on? We, why couldn't we? And he said, a lack of faith on your part. Well, the mountain is a wonderful experience. But Jesus brought the disciples back down into the messy, messy world. And sometimes stuff in life can get pretty messed up and mangled. You want to know something? That's where Messiah is needed. The disciples were called to listen to Jesus. That's what they were told. Listen to him. Peter especially needed to hear that. His understanding of Messiah was to build a shrine to keep him on the mountain. That he believed would best serve Israel and it would keep Jesus out of harm's way. We'll preserve Jesus. We'll preserve his name. We'll preserve the sanctity of the shrine. The way of Jesus, however, was to be among people. The way of Jesus took him into the middle of the messed up and mixed up world. Beyond that, it would take him to a place where he would suffer and die for the individuals in that mixed up world. AKA you and I. Listen to Jesus. To listen to Jesus is to know the way of suffering, even death. It is to know that the only way to change things truly is through faith and prayer. It's a reminder for us that should we seek to build shrines to honor Jesus, instead we should look at and remember that Jesus didn't desire a shrine. The needs of those among whom he lived were too great for that. And those needs are still too great today. Let us pray. We come to you, Father, and thanks for your grace and love. Being reminded that even as we experience the mountaintop and, and see the transfiguration of Christ, we know and are reminded how much we need to listen. To listen to him. Guide us and teach us in this, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.